Hey guys, um, welcome everyone to the AMA with Optimism. So I'll just briefly introduce myself. So I'm Lawrence from the business development team here at Perpetual Protocol. And we have Yenwen. Uh, did you want to briefly introduce yourself, Yenwen? Um, sure. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm the co-founder of uh, Perpetual Protocol. And uh, yeah, nice to be here. Yeah, we also have Ben, who's joining us from the Optimism team. Did you sort of want to briefly introduce yourself, Ben? Sure thing. Hey, everyone. I'm Ben, one of the co-founders of the Optimism team. They also call me Weird Eth Yankovic because in my spare time, I make uh, shit posts, uh, music videos. So check me out. <laughs> Thanks for having me on, guys. Oh, nice. I'll definitely have to check that out. Um, yeah, awesome. So the first question I wanted to sort of ask to you, Ben, was... What is optimism? So for people that really aren't familiar with optimism, like what sort of do you guys do? And like, yeah, just want to know what do you sort of define as optimism? Oh, great question. It's a whole emotion, baby. <laughs> um, sure. So optimism is a public benefit corp. What does this mean? This basically means that we are a um, company that sits somewhere between a nonprofit and a for-profit entity. And have a mission that we have to uphold of promoting open source and financial inclusivity to the world. Um, in particular, what are we working on? We're building a network called Optimistic Ethereum, which is a layer two scaling solution for Ethereum. Basically, what that means is that it gets its security derived from the layer one Ethereum that you know and love. So it's super secure and decentralized. And it gives you cheaper fees and faster transactions. Um, so yeah, basically we are the, uh, we are the main entity, um, you know, among a larger community that's pushing out the optimistic Ethereum protocol to the world. Yeah. Awesome. That, that, that actually sounds like really awesome. Um, and then I think you sort of briefly touched on it as well. So like, what is the importance of layer two scaling solutions for Ethereum? Like, especially right now with like, maybe not recently, but as of recent with gas prices being so high, like how do you sort of layer two scaling solutions help solve this? Yeah. So, I mean, obviously this is something that's very much on everyone in the public's mind and honestly, certainly even more than when we, when we started working on, on scaling. Right. But um, what is the reason that we need scaling? Well, I mean, basically these blockchain things are super wonderful, right? They're these magic trust machines that live in the sky and they're unstoppable and censorship resistant and all that. Um, but they only have so much, uh, you know, so many resources, just like anything, they are a finite resource. And so what we see on Ethereum today, right, is that that resource is in high demand and the demand is, you know, sort of moving us way up a supply curve that's draw driving prices really high. So what do we seek to do as a scaling solution? Well, we want to lower that back down, right? So uh, basically increase the size of these pipes so that we can fit more transactions and give more people access to this magical trust machine in the sky. Um, so I, yeah, I think in terms of like the, the um, problem statement, right? It's like pretty simple, right? Fees are super high, we need to lower them down. Um, there's some other uh, parts to that too, right? So one of, the, one of the other parts of it is that the latency in Ethereum is very high, right? So blocks are, you know, come about every 12 seconds or so, and that'll be reduced a bit with the merge, but in general, it's not a great UX. It's certainly not the Web2 experience of instant click and reactions that you know about. Um, so that's another thing that we try to accomplish. Ultimately, the goal is about bringing this technology to the masses, right? And improving UX and lowering fees are basically the two core tenets of what you need to do there on a technical level. Um, I, would also, like, I would also call out that um, another thing that's very important to us is scaling Ethereum's values as well. Right, so I think we're living in a world right now where projects, um, you know, there's many e quote ETH killers, right, that are out there trying to promote their lower fee um, chains. And it's important that what we don't do as we scale is sacrifice the values of both decentralization and open source and, and you know, inclusivity along the way. So that's something that's super important to us as well. Yeah, awesome. That like that definitely makes a lot of sense. And yeah, that definitely is really something that like um, people sort of need, especially right now with like the sort of narrative of Ethereum killers, but like optimistic roll up sort of well, optimism itself sort of like 
keeps true to the values of Ethereum. And then I sort of like briefly touched on it just then, but so optimism uses sort of like optimistic rollups. Could you sort of briefly explain what optimistic rollups are? Sure thing, sure thing. Okay, so in general, right, optimistic rollups was sort of uh, the, the the design is sort of something that we came to after a, a long time of research and development in the scalability space. You know, that's not to say that all the problems are solved, but we saw that this was identified as a very important milestone in figuring out all of this. Okay, so how do these optimistic scaling protocols work, right? We need to use, okay, well, okay, maybe I'll start here. One option is you just create a new chain, right? You just kind of copy and paste Ethereum and that could, you know, technically give you twice the number of transactions. But the issue with that is that, you know, Ethereum enforces and incentivizes its own security, right? So when you create a new L1, right, you're not bringing over the security and decentralization properties of the first chain. So the goal of a rollup is to scale and provide more, more transactions in a way that is compatible with or basically more efficiently uses the existing quote layer one chain that we know and love so that that's kind of that's kind of the mission and philosophy of how you do this right sort of pragmatically right what is the intuition for how this works basically um, you just imagine using ethereum layer one as a sort of court system right it's this trustless thing there are these contracts you can enforce permissionless decentralization right you can do all of these things and it's about using that space more efficiently. So the, the analogy we love to use is like, you don't go to court to cash a check. You go to court if the check bounces. And this is where the word optimistic comes in. It comes from optimistic execution, which is a similar kind of idea. Basically what you do is you uh, provide a way, this is the quote roll up part of it, for transactions to be submitted to layer one, but not executed. Another, you might also think of this as a notarization of a transaction. Um, it's, like an, it's like another framing for it. Basically, you submit transactions to Ethereum, but instead of when you know, when, normally when you submit a transaction from Alice to Bob on Ethereum, right, what happens? All of the nodes in the world, right, which is literally tens of thousands, right, all see that transaction, they do some computation on it, they process it, they say, okay, Alice is sending money to Bob, let's make sure Alice has enough money. Let's decrease the amount of money Alice now has. Let's increase how much Bob has by that amount. Subtract the fee, right? So on and so forth. You do all these things. And that costs gas. That's expensive. So instead, what you do with a roll-up is you don't do anything with those transactions other than basically notarize them and sign off that they existed and they are here and you record a hash. Then there is a, a, a smart contract where people can propose what the result of that transaction would have been if it were to be executed, right? So someone off chain, not as a part of the all 10,000 nodes doing it. Someone off chain says, okay, what did this transaction that got notarized do? It's gonna pay Alice to Bob. So let's do all those things, decrease Alice's balance, increase Bob's, et cetera. And they basically just propose a hash, which is the result of what you would expect that transaction to do. Um, now, the whole way that you keep the security is that there's a mechanism for the, that notarize, notarized transaction to come back to around and basically prove a fault if the hash that was proposed does not match what the result of execution should have been. So this is where the optimistic part comes in, right? You sort of optimistically assume that someone proposed the right thing. And if they didn't propose the right thing, somebody can submit this dispute, right? It's like taking them to court. That person will get slashed and the you know, invalid state will be removed. So there, there, there's, uh, there's roll up in a nutshell. You don't go to court to cash a check, just go when the court bounces and the court system gets less congested and can fit more things if you do that. Yeah, awesome. That's actually a really nice way that uh, you sort of put optimistic roll ups and sort of the optimistic aspect and like sort of how it works. Cause like, I think it's a little bit confusing for some people, but then the way you sort of put it really makes sense. And so now I sort of wanted to ask a question about how much cheaper and faster will optimism be compared to like regular layer one Ethereum? Great question. So look, I mean, there's a lot of factors. And so what I'll caveat this with is my, one of the most common caveats that I give, which is that uh, there is probably no term that is as misused and uh, uh, honestly abused 
in, in the blockchain space as TPS, transactions per second, right? There's a lot more nuance to that. What can those transactions do? What can, uh, what, is the, what are the security assumptions of those transactions, right? So it, it, it's, a, it's a very simple sounding question, right? Surprisingly nuanced answer, but I'll try to, I'll try to give some simple, some simple answers, right? So basically there are two ways to look at this, right? One way is, um, I, I, and then, the, uh, hang on, Let, I, I got too excited. Let me reset. <laughs> okay, so the question is how much cheaper do you get than L1? Okay, so basically what that, that question translates to is what is the cost of doing this notarization step, right? This thing that allows you to take someone to court uh, later on if you need to. What is the cost to do that notarization in comparison to the cost to execute the gas, to, to execute the whole transaction up front? And interestingly, the answer to that actually is, is dependent on the transaction type. So you might see a 10x increase, you might see a 5x increase, it, we actually often see 100 or 300x increases, right? And the reason for this is basically, um, or decreases, I should say, right? Increases in the cheapness. <laughs> Doesn't make as much sense. I think the, the overall thing to say, right, is that it depends on the size of that transaction you're notarizing. So if there's a lot of gas that would be going on on L1, right, of like computing different values, maybe checking for a liquidation or something or other, you know, calling out to a bunch of contracts, if there's a bunch of, if that's a really complex transaction doing all those things, the amount of savings that you get increases because you don't have to do, because you're doing all that stuff off chain. So it really depends on the transaction. Um, you can go to, I will show um, l2fees.info, l2fees.info, shout out to the L2B team and David Nihal. Um, so you can see what those numbers are for things like transfers and swaps. Um, and the answer sort of depends on those, but you know, the blanket answer is like somewhere from five to 300 X today. Um, now, what is the purpose? Well, how, now, one very important note is that that will go down over time. In fact, the entire Ethereum roadmap right now is effectively centered around decreasing that cost. And basically the way you do this is you make systems that are more and more optimized for this notarization process, right? Because that's where the cost comes from. So the ultimate version of this is called ETH2 phase one, or at least it was, it's you know, one of the upcoming phases to the Ethereum roadmap. And that is, that is basically sharding this, exactly this notarization process, right? So what is sharding? It's like breaking the L1 into kind of sub chains, right? There's a particular step in the Ethereum roadmap, which is literally all, only exists to shard that notarization process and make those transactions cheaper. So in that world, you get many, like, you know, multiple orders of magnitude on top of that, you know, five to 300 X, right? You're going to, to basically hundreds of thousands of roll up transactions per second that, you know, in some sense, you think of it as notarizations per second in that way. Um, and that, that gets incredibly, incredibly high. So yeah, that's a little bit about where it's at now and where it's headed. Yeah, awesome. That's actually, that sounds like really, really cheap, um, especially for like some of the more complex transactions. It sounds really, really like, uh, it, it's sort of like what people sort of want for sort of like L1 Ethereum, but then, you know, it's like currently just not possible. And then I sort of wanted to ask, um, in terms of comparisons against like sort of other layer ones out there, how does like optimism stack up against something, something like, uh, like an avalanche in terms of fees as well? And sort of like, where do you see it in the future sort of stacking up? Yeah, that's a great question. So, I mean, look, uh, you know, uh, to be frank, right, one of the phrases that we throw around is you get what you pay for, right? And I mean, that's a tongue in cheek to some extent, and it's true in other sense, senses. So, like, the reality is that there are other L1s out there that today, this, this isn't so much true in that, in that, you know, ETH2 world where we make the, that notarization much cheaper. And actually, there's even some short term proposals that will get us down to like 20 cents a transaction, which is pretty competitive, right? But it is possible for other L1s to be cheaper. And basically, this is because they don't root their security in Ethereum, right? So because they have their own chain and they're doing their own thing, you accept that you have a different set of security trade off, you know, assumptions, but you can lower prices. So I think that's true today more than it will be in the long term. And on it, like to be candid, part of the role of optimism as we see ourselves in scaling is basically making sure that Ethereum survives in what is in some sense, 
not, not an attack, but what is a, a compromisation of values in comparison to what Ethereum wants in the name of lower fees today. Um, so that, that's sort of a framing for it. Like, honestly, there are cheaper L1s today, but they're their own thing. And so you're, they're not, the reason that they're cheaper is because you're not paying for that security that you get with, with a, a roll up. Yeah, that um, makes I, perfect sense. Uh, should I speak to Sorry, the oh, you go. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, I'd really to, love to hear some of the future. I'll speak briefly to the future, which is that, that basically becoming less and less true, um, by which I mean the cost becoming more and uh, approaching uh, what, what those other L1s you see are out there right now. Um, so like I said, there, um, you know, with ETH2, but also even in the shorter term, there's a new EIP called 4488, which we are big supporters of because it will probably 5x uh, make, make transactions on all the rollups like 5x cheaper. So that um, in the future, that notarization cost will go down drastically. Um, and at that point, you basically the prices in comparison to these other L1s will be very similar. I, there's more nuance that's probably that we could get out if, if you ask the right follow-up questions, but I think I'll, I'll leave it there for the sake of, uh, sake of brevity. Yeah, awesome. That that is actually like some really really fair sort of like comments and sort of like uh yeah, it's like you're sort of sacrificing sort of the oh uh, like the security assumptions of Ethereum if you sort of go on these layer ones, you might get sort of cheaper fees for now, but then sort of in the future with sort of the two point roadmap, it, I can see it all sort of eventually um all sort of like bouncing out towards the end. Um and I sort of wanted to ask now, like what are the sort of differences in design uh, that Optimism has compared to some of the, like, the, some of the other optimistic rollups that are currently available right now? Yeah, good question. So I think that the most important thing in the progression of Optimism is an upgrade that we did um, about a month ago now, which was our upgrade to, quote, EVM equivalence. Okay, what does that mean? Basically, what I threw under the rug with my intro definition of what a rollup is, right, is that Designing a solidity contract, right, a smart contract dispute system that uh, intermediates disputes about the execution of an L2 is very, 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 very difficult. Um, and it's take, and it's, there's really been a progression of what we've had to figure out to be able to do that effectively. So our first iteration of that was called the OVM, and it was something that was like the EVM. You could compile and deploy your contracts to it. But it wasn't quite the same. So the biggest push that we've, that we've been making since we launched um, almost a year ago now, wow, that's crazy. Um, Got to mark that anniversary on my calendar. Um, one of the big pushes that we've made since then is to get full EVM equivalence. And basically this means that exactly the standards and the um, exact functions which execute smart contracts on layer one apply to layer two. That's been, a, that's been a really big one for us. So we're the only, the only L2 out there um, that will literally take bit for bit your smart contract and run it bit for bit how it is run on layer one. Okay, the, you know, there's tiny exceptions that are fundamental to L2, but for all intents and purposes, it becomes a true one-click deploy experience where exactly what you see on layer one happens on layer two. So since we've made that upgrade, that has been a boon like so many so many devs have been like oh i just deployed immediately that was everless so i think that's a big one um i think another way in which um we differentiate is in thinking about the long-term roadmap of ethereum and trying to fulfill some of the the pieces of that um so in particular i think that there's a narrative right now um that these chains like solana are basically making these big block chains with a low validator set and very large blocks and that they're going to be cheap. And honestly, I think that we are one of the few projects that's ultimately here to provide an answer to that. Um, other rollups kind of say, okay, we're going to have these rollups. They're going to be these small things and we're going to bridge them all together. And bridging is very, very, very different than the approach that a project like Solana takes. So in the long run, one of the most important differentiators for us is going to be basically giving Ethereum an answer to that uh, Solana in a way that doesn't sacrifice decentralization and that doesn't sacrifice the core values of Ethereum. Yeah, awesome. That, that actually sounds like 
that sounds great. And sort of this briefly touches on something that I wanted to like also ask, um, especially with sort of how our EVM equivalent sort of uh, optimism is. What is the process regarding deploying an optimism right now? Like if someone wanted to take the sort of, you know, app from like Ethereum layer one and then move it over to optimism, like what sort of process do they have to go through? The process now is almost completely effortless. Literally just point your software at L2 instead of pointing it at L1. Um, like truly, truly, like ba basically our whole push for EVM equivalence and like our main engineering efforts right now are what we call minimal diff, right? This is basically finding the minimal difference between how Ethereum works and how L2 needs to work and implementing it that way so that the effort is as low as possible. So if you are a dev that has deployed on L1, you should be able to, with no changes, take that code and deploy it to L2 effortlessly. Um, that's huge for us. Look, there are some small exceptions, right? One exception is that you pay for fees a little bit differently, right? Because we talked about that notarization before. So when you send a transaction, you pay to get this thing notarized. And that's a little bit different of a sort of gas market than you see on, on layer one. So that's a little bit different, right? The other difference is this is its own chain. So depending on the project that you're deploying, you might want to provide users a way to bridge in, right? And deposit and withdraw assets, right? We provide a way for you to do that, but there might be reasons or connections that you want to make that aren't standard to that um, default flow that we provide on our gateway. Um, so there are those small differences, but for the most part, it is one click and go. That's all you need. Yeah, also awesome. that actually is amazing. Um, especially because I think there has been sort of like questions around like, how can we sort of deploy an optimism? If it's just that sort of simple, um, then that's like something that's really, really awesome. And then- Oh, there's, there's one last piece of um, FUD that you might be hitting on there, which is that, um, look, this software is all extremely new and we saw it as our responsibility to basically keep track of things and handhold the protocol as it grows in and becomes more battle tested, right? So for a period of time, we, uh, we have maintained a whitelist where to deploy on L2, we basically have to whitelist you. Okay, two things to say about that. The first thing is just to dispel FUD, that, that getting whitelisted is a matter of going through a type form where we'll stay in touch so that we can contact you if we see something going wrong and sending us the key that we're gonna whitelist. And that will happen for you within a week. Um, so that's been the case for months now. Um, and we've seen something like 40 or 50 projects deploy using those means. Okay, second point though, that I can officially alpha leak, I have determined that I can officially alpha leak that whitelist is going away next week. So we finally feel like the network is stable enough and we're confident in everything that's going on that it is time to turn off that whitelist. This, wow, actually, <laughs> this might be our first public announcement of that. So whoever's on this Twitter space, you've got some free alpha there. Not that you can do much with it unless you're a dev, but if you are a dev and you don't wanna fill out a simple form where we can uh, talk to you if, 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 if something is gonna happen, uh, then just wait a week and you're good to go. Oh, wow. That's awesome. That's like definitely a huge alpha leak there for everyone that's sort of listening to this Twitter space right now. Um, <laughs> Indeed. I don't know. I don't know. I feel comfortable revealing alpha. I don't know if there's any way for you to really uh, leverage yourself on it, but uh, it's a, it's a fun piece of info, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's definitely like a really, really interesting um, piece of info. That's definitely awesome as well. And I think that sort of touches onto the next thing. Cause like with the whitelisting process, like definitely the good thing about it was like, you were able to sort of help projects like sort of help them along the way and see if there's anything going wrong or there's something that they need to fix or sort of whatnot um, with that process. And then now for like new projects that sort of want to build an optimism, is there any, any other ways for them to sort of get help from the optimism team or like some sort of funding or like something like along those lines? Great question. Um, stay tuned on the funding part of the question. I, I don't have any info to share there right now. Um, as for the rest, we have a very active community. We have a Discord that we very carefully um, strive to keep from being a uh, toxic, uh, no, you know, standard crypto Discord. So come check us out. The only thing that I'll say is, um, I think optimism.io slash Discord should work. But anyway, it's on optimism.io somewhere. The only thing that I'll say is, look, that uh, form that I was talking about for whitelisting, like I said, there was a lot of FUD around that, but that is an extremely useful tool and an extremely useful community building tool. So the, the form is not going away. It will be replaced and transmuted. It will no longer be called whitelist form. It will be called 
I don't know, something like community or onboarding form. And that's a great way to make sure that we're in touch and like, you know, can give you guys the support where you need it and all that good stuff. Yeah, definitely. That, that makes a lot of sense. And I think that's like a really, really interesting sort of point. It's like the whitelist was sort of there, like also to sort of like help sort of new projects that are sort of building on top of optimism and sort of provide them that early stage help that they might need. Indeed, indeed. A great little community forming. Well, I don't even think little is the right word anymore. It's growing very rapidly. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And then uh, sort of one of my final questions that I had at least was, how do you see optimism's role in the future of Ethereum like as a whole? Uh, I think it's sort of, you've already briefly touched on this, but like, yeah, some sort of final points on that. Yeah, no, no, it's definitely worth talking about again. So I did touch on this a little bit in terms of the technological alignment between ro what rollups need to scale and what the next phases of, of, of Ethereum uh, provide, right? So basically, again, just to harp on it again, it's lowering that cost of notarization, right? AKA rolling up things, right? That's where roll up comes from. So the cheaper it becomes to roll things up, the better every, everything gets. And that is a central part of Ethereum's long-term future. And, you know, what was formerly known as ETH2 phase one, I think we're just supposed to call it the future of Ethereum now. So that's on a sort of techno, technical front in terms of where rollups are at today. I think the other thing that I would say for our future that we're thinking about, and I, I did touch on this a bit as well, but that we're thinking about more and more recently is effectively once these first generation uh, rollups that we see today have matured, right, and they're maturing quickly, what is next, right? I think that's a really important question to be asking and where do we fit in with that? And I think realistically, what is next is to provide an answer to these big block, big blocker, big blockchain chains um, that are basically trading off a bunch of decentralization in the name of low fees and cheap UX. And I think that what you are going to see from us over the next year is basically the next generation of rollups that take the countless uh, research questions and solutions that the Ethereum research community has been working on for ETH2 over the course of literally years now and actually applying them to rollups. Because it turns out, and I think our sort of EVM equivalence highlights this very well, it turns out that a lot of those problems are really the same. And really what you're doing when you make a rollup is you're making a, uh, a scaling solution that doesn't require a hard fork of L1 to enact. And this basically means that you're more agile, you can try things out more quickly, and you can build out the future. So in the next year, the big push for optimism is going to be taking these first gen rollups and expanding them into the full like global scale uh, that we need. Because right now we can do it, but we can't do it without some sacrifices. So we need to sort those out. And so I'm super excited about that. Yeah, perfect. Um... Yeah, that's perfect, actually. And that sort of really nicely summarizes, like, where optimism fits in, like, a future of Ethereum and, like, also sort of in the broader future of the crypto space um, as it evolves. And that's pretty much all the questions that I had. And then I wanted to ask if Yen Wen had any questions. And if not, if anyone in the audience had any questions, just sort of request to speak. And, uh, yeah, we can sort of invite you up on stage and then you can sort of ask. Um, there's actually one thing I want to add is like our experience, like the building on top of Optimism. And um, so um, the Perpetual Protocol, we actually start looking, I mean, like we, we touch, I mean, like we evaluate Optimism like several months ago. I mean, uh, when, I mean, kind of like uh, the OVM V1 uh, that uh, we, uh, because they are like some limitation on that, uh, we, we have to modify the codes in order to, fit, I mean, like our contract in OVM V1, then we kind of like um, don't really go down that route, I mean, several months ago. But uh, we re evaluate that once the OVM V2 comes out, I mean, like like two or three weeks ago, I think the whole like voting process is really fast. It only costs us like a week, I think less than a week, because we do a lot of tasking, we do a lot of stress tasking on Apneesim, but uh, we we don't really like bump into any problem. Um, yeah, I think like uh, like Ben said that uh, it's really it's just like uh, you know just like it meant that you don't need really need to change anything. 
One thing I want to add is that the, the block time is a little bit different because uh, I think in per perpetual protocol we do TWAP, so we you know we they, they are some assumption on the time, so uh so the block time I mean like um I think right now I mean they they are kind of like several scap I mean will be updated in the future but the right now it's getting the kind of like getting the the block time of layer one that's a little bit different from what we think but uh. I think that's just a kind of a small issue, and then it it doesn't really cause anything on our end. It's just like uh, the 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 TWAP is slower. Yeah. So I, I would just say that uh, the porting is really fast. So like like we we spend a week, and then we spend another week like sorting out other things like uh, the tools we can use, and then you know just just like try to deploy and then retest it, and then we launch. So it just costs uh, like two or three weeks totally. So yeah, really amazing that uh, you know we, we can deploy on Optimus and and um, and that everything. I think we don't have any issue. Like uh, of course we only run for like a week, but uh, yeah, really thankful for for the Optimus team that uh, I mean like built this like, fantastic product. Oh yeah, thanks everyone for the kind words. <laughs> yeah, that's super great. Um, yeah, I I mean just to add on that that exact story is of, oh, it, it was going to take me, I, I looked into optimism and it was going to require some modifications to my contracts and that made it a no-go. Turned around into, oh, we hit deploy and in less than a week or and in a lot of cases a day, everything was deployed. That is a story that we are so happy is one that people can tell now and we're super thankful um, for you guys being able to do that. So yeah, exciting stuff. EVM equivalents, baby, tell your friends. <laughs> Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, yeah, definitely the EVM equivalence is like such a huge factor and it's so awesome to sort of see. Um, this might be a little bit of a spicy question, but um, in terms of uh, recently sort of the narrative around sort of zero knowledge sort of proofs and zero knowledge rollups as well. Um, so you have things like Starkware sort of launching their mainnet and you sort of have sort of rumblings about like other sort of uh, zero knowledge rollups that are sort of maybe starting development. How do you sort of see optimism and optimistic rollups sort of fitting in a like a world where both zero knowledge rollups exist and optimistic rollups exist? Totally. Pardon me one sec. Ooh, there we go. Excuse me. Ah, uh, yes. These the classic spicy zk versus optimistic rollup question. Totally. So I mean, look, there's a few things to say here, right? One is that zero knowledge proofs are amazing, amazing technology super, super promising stuff and incredibly, incredibly powerful. Um, and we have a massive amount of respect for the people working on these things and um, are really excited to see how they play out. In terms of you know, the framing of it as competitive, I'm not sure that that's the right framing, right? I think that certainly what we can do with this EVM equivalent stuff on rollups today and in the, and in the near to mid future are going to hold as only possible with an optimistic rollup, right? We're starting to see the first inklings of sort of EVM-like stuff in ZK rollups. Um, but as we learn from the past year of the OVM, something that is EVM-like and something that is EVM equivalent are two very fundamental things and fundamentally change the pace of innovation and uh, portability that you can do. Not to mention the drastic differences that you get losing tooling. So I, I think this is something that is maybe hard to appreciate if you're not a dev. And even if you're a dev just coming onto the scene, I cannot speak highly enough about the evolution of the Ethereum development experience over the past few years. Like when I think back to my first uh, like smart contracts I was writing, writing Plasma contracts and dealing with Web3 JS and all, <laughs> I don't know, the list goes on, right? But all of this, all of this experience, right? Because developing for blockchains is hard. So much tooling has been put into the EVM. And because a lot of that tooling works at these deep architectural fundamental levels, you lose that tooling, even when you introduce small differences, right? That's what happened to us with the OVM. We weren't even then moving to a whole new, right? Moon math system of evaluation of state transitions. We were just making some small diffs so that it could run in a smart contract. So I think that, ZK rollups are awesome. I don't think it's competitive. We will see both flourish over the next several years. And, you know, in the long run, maybe it will be possible for ZK rollups 
to support the kind of equivalence and tooling and innovation that we need to see. And that's something we're keeping an eye on. Um, and it's super exciting. So, yeah, I, I don't know. It's, I don't think it's as spicy a question as people like to make it out to be. Um, and it's incredibly cool stuff. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. Like, I don't think so. We're going to see EVM equivalents for any of these sort of ZK rollups, like just yet. That's for sure. Um, it's sort of something that more in the future. And then like things like Optimism right now, they already support like EVM equivalents right now. So you can sort of just go and deploy, um, like making small other, tweaks here and there. But yeah. The other thing that I do want to call out here is um, <laughs> recently it's become a real uh, crypto and even crypto Twitter buzzword of modularity and the quote modular blockchain. But the other thing that I'll say is that when you dive into what's going on and what we're building at a technical level for optimistic Ethereum, um, it's not, it's the entirety of it is not building out these fault proofs so that you can do these disputes. And it's the entirety of it will not at all be deprecated by the introduction of an EVM equivalent validity proof, right? Zero knowledge proof. The reality is that there's tons of other tooling, right? All this stuff that, that about sequencing and how you pay for fees and uh, how, you, how, you move, how users may want to move across chains or bridge assets. All of these things are still totally applicable, especially when you're following an existing standard like the EVM. So that's the only other thing I'll say is that if suddenly one of these magic ZK proofs appeared overnight, it's not like all of the devs on the Optimism team would go, oh my goodness, all of this work that we've wasted, right? So much of that still applies because of this modularity property that you want to preserve. So I think that's just the only other thing I would say is that how you enforce these things is really only a small piece of the picture of how L2s are going to run in the long run and how things like MEV are addressed and censorship resistance. So all of these things are sort of part of a larger pie of scalability and honest, quite frankly, politics, like protocol politics. Um, you know, crypto Twitter is a mess every other week and someone else is going to bat against the ETH killers, right? So all of those things are also a part of what we see ourselves as doing. And that will not change with a new technology, with a new, you know, enforcement technology. So there's tons of other stuff going on there. Yeah, yeah, awesome. That uh, that definitely sort of really dispels some of the questions that I think a lot of people sort of have around sort of like zero knowledge rollups. And they sort of like always like to compare it with optimistic rollups. Um, and then this sort of goes into another question I had actually was that um, th there has been some like people sort of like to point out like how when you deposit sort of bridge over to optimism and then when you bridge back, there is that sort of like that initial wait time. But um, this sort of issue is not really something that people should be thinking of in terms of that there's already bridges that sort of maybe have some sort of trade-offs in terms of security, but they sort of offer that sort of faster service. Um, what sort of bridges would you recommend? And like, do you have anything to sort of say? Yeah. Oh, oh my God. I can ramble for hours about bridges. Don't get me started. Okay. <laughs> let me, let me synthesize uh, a briefer answer. Okay. So a few things, right? Let's be very clear. The vision for, scalable blockchains with layer two is not one in which all of these users are bridging back to L1 all the time, right? Think about it this way. Imagine that using a roll up meant that every time you want to use it, you deposited your money in, then you did a transaction on the roll up, then there was, you, you know, you did your trade or whatever, then you withdrew the result of that trade out, right? So yes, the trade in the middle there would be cheaper, but if every single user is doing that, then you actually have doubled the amount of demand for layer one, right? Because you need to do the withdrawal and deposit and the withdrawal. So first of all, I think that part of what we're seeing with some of these bridge pains are simply a byproduct of it being early days for the adoption of this technology. And as in the long term, we'll probably see a world in which you don't have to bridge so often because everything that you want to do is on the roll up, right? So I think that's one important caveat to to set is that some of these UX problems are longstanding and need to be solved, but a lot of that friction is actually here as a result of people wanting to do things that they can't yet on the rollup because there's less liquidity or you know fewer applications deployed, less adoption. Okay, so that's one part of it. Um, 
with that being said, obviously, you like that argument that I made holds true even when there is a lot of value and there are still people that will want to move in and out of these these chains, right? So you do want bridging protocols that will allow you to move the funds around. And ideally, you almost by necessity, right, because of that problem of if everyone deposits and withdraws, you haven't actually lowered the demand. You want to be able to move from one roll up to another, right? And this is sort of the core, or from one roll up to another L2, right? Maybe there's a game that doesn't require the high security of a roll up, but you want to move some funds there, right? So you do still need to have bridges for this reason. Okay. Let me pause there and take a breath, and then I'll start. I'll talk briefly about the landscape of bridges. Whoo! <laughs> okay. All right. So in terms of bridges. Um, there's a few notes on bridges, right? One note is that not all bridges are made the same. You have a spectrum of security and decentralization. On one, of the, uh, one end of that spectrum, you have something that is super cheap, but totally centralized, right? So an example of this um, that I wanna shout out, but in my uh, adrenaline fueled hyperspeak is escaping me by name. Um, tell, there we go, teleporter. So teleporter is the cheapest bridge to optimism. You lit, and the way it works is you literally send ETH to a random account and there's a server running somewhere that will send you ETH back on, on Optimism. And because you don't sort of execute the deposit, it's just sort of this trusted bridge, right? That's like as cheap as it possibly can be. Here's another example of that, actually. One of the big pushes that we're doing right now is getting fiat on and off ramps. So basically being able to go right from Coinbase or Binance or whoever right onto the rollup, right? Interestingly, that's actually a form of bridging, right? You might not think of it as such, but imagine that there were two rollups and both were supported by Binance, right? You could actually move your funds around by withdrawing to Binance from one chain and deposit and or depositing to Binance with one chain and withdrawing from Binance to the other chain, right? So these are this that's sort of one end of the extreme of like a centralized bridge. Um, and, there, and there's very valid use cases for that. And there's very valid reasons to trust that Binance will do a good job for you there. Okay, so that's one end of the spectrum is sort of centralized. And I, I think maybe even more nuanced than that is like uh, under collateralized. So it's not the case that um, like if Binance were to be hacked, then there's this period of time in which you could lose the money by trying to bridge it, right? But, maybe, but, but probably not. On the other end of the spectrum, you have projects like uh, Hop Protocol and Connects, which do provide stronger guarantees. And that, that basically comes down to collateralization, right? There's a happy path where your money moves over right away. And there's a sad, sad path where the money takes more time to be bridged. And the worst thing that can happen to a user is that that happy path doesn't go so well because the system was compromised, but the user doesn't lose that money. They just have to wait for the slow path of the bridge to complete. So that's sort of the other end of the spectrum of bridges. And I think that we will see the economics of that play out, that those may be more expensive in the long run, but they're more uh, trustless. And so there's a lot of value in that. So I, I in, oh, pardon me. I think in terms of bridges, like, what's my favorite bridge? Man, I don't know. It depends on what you're doing, really. If you want to move a lot of funds, but you still want to move them quickly, not through the native bridge, you should use something like Hop or Connects. Um, if you just want to go try out Optimus Ethereum, then you should use something like Teleporter because it's going to be way cheaper. Okay, that was a lot. Bridge rant over. Yeah, yeah, perfect. But that actually answers sort of like, um, I think a lot of the questions people have when it comes to like bridging to optimism and actually getting to optimism, um, especially like it's a really interesting point you said, like the centralized exchange, like sort of like on and off ramps for optimistic Ethereum. Like, I think people don't sort of maybe forget that that's actually somewhat a centralized bridge that you can use um, when it sort of becomes available. But yeah. That, that's really awesome, actually. And that was I mean, look, back like a really in the day, great way. I used to give a very, back in the day, a few years ago, I used to give a presentation on L2 scaling, and I had a slide that said, Coinbase is an L2. We've since decided that L2s are a little more specific terminology and that they really count as these roll-ups or these um, things like plasmas and channels, which have these stronger security guarantees. But they are bridges, right? They are their own something, right? And you can use them to move funds around. Yeah, it's really interesting. Yeah, yeah, awesome. Um, yeah, that, that definitely sort of like answers that uh, that question. Um, so if anyone else has any questions, just like sort of raise your hand in the audience and I'll sort of invite you up uh, onto the stage. And then for now, I think I think you've already briefly maybe touched on this as well, but um, do you sort of see a future in Ethereum where there'll just sort of be like a whole bunch of different L2 rollups out there and where do you see sort of like optimism fitting in with like all the different sort of roll-ups? Like, 
do you think there'll just be one roll-up that everyone's going to have an activity on, or do you think there'll be a future where there'll be multiple different ones? Great, great question. And I think one that uh, actually can really lead to some spicy debate. So uh, one thing I would say right off the bat is if y'all haven't seen Vitalik's Endgame post that he put out recently, I would highly, highly, highly recommend checking that out. That is a very insightful take on where the direction of, of roll-ups and blockchains in general are headed right now. And a lot of how we think that we will fit in with that ecosystem is extremely consistent with what, what, what Vitalik just put out. Um, so I'll start with that chill. Go check out Vitalik's blog. Okay. In terms of what will it look like? Will there be many roll-ups? I, look, there are people that are going to want to pay for different amounts of security. And there are always going to be people trying to create chains. So I think it's uh, not realistic to say that there will be one roll-up. That does not mean that the distribution of value and liquidity and activity will be the same across all of those rollups. And I, I don't think that will be the case. Um, I think the other thing to say here, and I sort of touched on this before with like Optimism's 2022 front as being sort of going after, you know, defending Ethereum's values against Solana, honestly. I think the other side of this, which isn't talked about as much, is that if you were to imagine a future where you take all the rollups today and there's just a bunch more of them and they all use ETH2, I think that anyone who sees that future is being a little short-sighted or at least selling themselves short on the potential of what blockchains are going to do. The reality is that none of the chains that we see today, even if you make e each chain super application specific, I don't think any of them have enough scalability, or I guess more technically you would say throughput, have enough throughput to satisfy the demand that we are going to see if, if this really is the future of the internet. So yes, there will be many roll-ups because that's just the nature of markets and that's the nature of people wanting to make different trade-offs. We will also see very, very big roll-ups with big blocks that are not going to have the same decentralization problems of the generation of big blockchains that we see today but they will support a bunch of financial activity. I think this is very natural, right? This is exactly what we see in the real world if we look at financial markets, right? There are hubs. And so I think that we will see hubs that are hubs both in terms of bridging and in terms of liquidity and in terms of um, activity. So I think that it's kind of, kind of like a TLDR is it's both, right? There obviously will be lots of these chains, but there will also be really, really big fat ones and if the usage of blockchains goes viral in the way that you know, I think everyone that truly believes understands, those chains will have to do way more than we think of them doing today, way more. Yeah, I definitely agree. Um, I, I actually have a question that, uh, so uh, you mentioned like MBV, so i just curious that as a developer, um, how should I think about like MBV on Optimism and, and uh, do, I mean, like, um, I I think there is like only like, like one like synchronous right now. So um, maybe I shouldn't like worry about that for now. And then once there are like multiple sequences in the future, how should I, I mean, like think about or prepare for the MBV, I mean, in the future? Great question, great question. So, okay, actually, I'm going to start this answer off with another shill, which is actually linked to in, in Vitalik's post that I just showed previously. But um, Flashbots, who are the driving force between MEV Geth and a lot of innovation in the sort of world of MEV, have recently put out a paper on cross-chain MEV. And this is something that I would highly, highly, highly recommend that folks read and think about if they are thinking about the future of MEV and how it would fit into something like optimistic Ethereum. So that's my, that's my go read more detail than I could ever say in words here. Okay, so go read that. How should we think about MEV? So first of all, Yenwen, yes, you are right. There is one centralized sequencer that we run right now. Obviously it is part of our decentralization roadmap for that not to be us and for that to become multiple parties. And in general, the philosophy that we have about MEV is that First of all, we should minimize it, especially when it's bad MEV, but also accept the, what is a very apparent reality at this point, which is that MEV is going to be fundamental to blockchains. And if you think of MEV in an abstract enough sense, like so many things that we see in the real world 
have MEV, right? Like information markets and people working for hedge funds that are right on the steps of DC trying to catch the ears of, uh, you know, Congress people. All of, right, all of these things are actually, I think, in the most abstract sense, a form of MEV. And so given that we have to accept that this isn't fundamental, one of the very important philosophies that we have is to extract that MEV and redistribute it to public goods. Um, so this is uh, a whole other rabbit hole, but, but I'll suffice it to say that while one of the very important commitments that we made um, as Optimism, first of all, to remove our incentive to retain centralized control of the sequencer, and second of all, because it's we think the right thing to do and an area that requires innovation in blockchains in addition to the scalability stuff is all of the fees that are paid on optimistic Ethereum today, all of them will be donated to public goods. And we just did our first experiment um, last month, uh, something called retroactive public goods funding, a construction that we, um, we are helping investigate that is sort of uh, Vitalik's brainchild. So we gave away our first million dollars in protocol revenue last month to public goods funding. And the reality is there will be some amount of MEV that is here to stay. The other aspect of MEV and, and sort of Yemen, to the extent that your question is asking, how should users think about this? Honestly, this is, there's two things to say, really. One is that these problems are yet unsolved, but there's a ton, ton, ton of research on ordering and um, fairness going on in the crypto space right now. Nobody has come close to cracking it yet. But this is absolutely something that is within the scope of the Optimistic Ethereum protocol to adopt. One example of this is um, some of the stuff going on in ETH2 research right now called um, uh, PBS, Proposer Blo uh, Builder Separation. Um, and there's lots, of other, there's lots of other things here. Um, so I don't know. This is, a, <laughs> this is another one like Bridges and actually very related to Bridges, truthfully, that I could ramble on about all day. I think where I'll leave it is some of this is fundamental, and we think it's extremely important that the fundamental MEV be extracted and given to public goods funding. And the second tenet is that we have to uh, minimize this wherever we can. And there's a lot of work left to be done there, um, but so some of the early beginnings of what we should do are starting to emerge. And that, those things will be adopted uh, by optimistic Ethereum as they, become, as they become available, or at least understood, we'll build them out. Awesome. Yeah, that, that's actually like a really, really uh, great answer and something that I also sort of had in mind as well. Um, and I also wanted to invite someone from the, the audience that sort of had a question. So Sam. Um... Oh, okay. He must have just dropped out. Oh, hello, hello, Sam. Bringing me on. Um, ben, I first heard you on the Bankless podcast. Very optimistic. Thank you so much. Um, a part of, uh, I had two questions. Uh, the first one was already answered by the previous uh, uh, listener who asked about uh, your centralized sequencer, where uh, uh, what your plans were to uh, somehow try to mitigate uh, risks from uh, a centralized party. Uh, and uh, uh, you mentioned that uh, you've got uh, plans on uh, bringing on multiple parties to be able to run the sequencer. Um, if you could shed more light on it, uh, that would be helpful. Um, the second question was about uh, um, how you see uh, risk on uh, bridges. I mean, so from, from what I uh, understand so far is that uh, uh, bridges uh, carry risk only when you are executing your transaction because once you've... Uh, uh, once you've gotten some to tokens over onto a different uh, uh, chain like Optimism, um, you no longer have to worry about, uh, uh, you know, what uh, bridge you used to onboard uh, these assets over. Cool. Well, thanks for the kind words, Sam, and uh, two great questions. Okay, I'll briefly talk on, touch on the multiple, the multiple sequencer stuff. Yeah, so... Uh, First of all, yes, your interpretation was correct there, and it is totally the case, um, and on, honestly not a part of the sort of, quote, unsolved problems or like future research that we will adopt um, in terms of MEV. We know how to do multiple sequencers, and that is absolutely the sort of next step on decentralizing that process. Um, you basically, 
effectively create a consensus protocol um, that runs the L2 chain. And so you have a set of validators or of sequencers or whatever you want to call them instead of just one. Okay, so that's, that's the first question. Second question, oh man, you're getting me back on bridges. You know how much, how much I love bridges. So let me just reiterate what the, the question was or share some context because it is the case and I touched on this, but I'll say it again. When you are bridging, under, the, under a, one key assumption, which is I think a reasonable definition of bridge, under the assumption that you are moving from the native asset as, uh, as opposed to a quote bridge asset, from a native asset on one chain to a native asset on the other chain, this is correct. Then this is a nice security property of bridges in general is that once your money has truly been moved over and you receive it on the destination chain, then you're no longer at risk. And so it is, this is a very good property that basically only the money that's quote in flight, right? Which you can kind of think of as like the volume of the bridge maybe is the money that could be stolen uh, from the perspective of a user, right? So that is, that is one notable thing. And I think this is something that I will preface uh, to any of the people using rollups, what that means is that before you bridge, you should go to Twitter or a status page. This is actually something we've been advocating for L2B to add, but you should, li you, you should literally go uh, check uh, what the status of the bridge is before you bridge. Because if the bridge was compromised and you send your funds into it, then they're gone, right? But if you go to the bridge and you don't, the bridge Twitter or whatever, and you see that it's not compromised, there's actually a good chance that you'll probably that you that you could make it, and so this is definitely definitely the case. Um, you know, if a bridge is going to be compromised in the next week, right? For the first half of that week, the bridge is fine, and the people who used it in the first half of that week will not be affected by that. So I don't know that that maybe sounds. Um, <laughs> I, I I don't want I don't want to make it say like oh these bridge things they're easy there's not much risk right there is real risk and if you're moving a lot of money you should use something that's in the collateralization, you know, category that I talked about before. Um, the only other thing that I will add, so that, that is totally the case. Um, the only other thing that I will add is that um, this is a very different answer if you are a uh, liquidity provider for a bridge. Then the answer is not, is not the same, right? So if your money is just, is, if you're just moving your, your, at liquidity across from one chain to another with a bridge, then everything that we said holds true. Assuming you pull the money out of the quote bridge asset, right? There are some weird bridge protocols where like you actually kind of keep a different bridged version of the asset on the other chain. And if you hold on to that, then what I said does not apply. The other, but by definition, what, one, one of the things that a bridge does is there's these liquidity providers that basically allow you to convert from the bridged asset to the native asset. And those people are holding on to the bridged asset for an extended period of time, right? Because they're providing liquidity for these people. So this is an asymmetric risk. Because users can pull their money out once they're on the other side of the bridge, they're no longer exposed to the risk. But the people providing liqui the liquidity that enables that are at risk in the long term. So if you're someone that's looking to do cross-chain um, sort of bridging arbitrage or basically providing liquidity around these protocols, then there's more nuance and there's more security aspects that you should keep in mind because your money is going to be sitting in a pool which is at risk for a longer term. Um, yeah, so I hope that I hope that helps, Sam. That totally did. Thank you so much. Sweet, no problem. Yeah, thank you, Sam, for like the great questions. Thank you, Ben. Um, I saw Lee had sort of put his hand up before. Did you have a question, Lee, or? I have a musical instrument next to me that I feel like I should be playing. Okay, sorry, I should post over. <laughs> that was great. Okay, it looks like Lee's... Oh. Hey, there we go. What's up, Lee? Nice to connect. Ask away. Yeah, sorry for the delay there. I 
I was not originally a host and then anyway there was some complication uh awesome uh jeopardy music that was great um or is that wheel of fortune anyway uh jeopardy. okay not a big tv watcher anyway my question actually was already asked uh so thanks to the person who asked um and yeah really great having you on and it's been pretty amazing hearing about some in-depth stuff about optimism so yeah thanks so much No problem, my pleasure. Yeah, I think, I think that, yeah. Um, yeah, thank you so much for coming as well. Um, but I think this sort of wraps up sort of the AMA we had. Uh, if anyone else had any questions this last second, just like make sure you sort of put your hand up. But yeah, thank you so much everyone for coming and you know, special thank you to Ben from Optimism for coming as well. Like really good to chat and really love to learn more about Optimism. And also thank you to Yanwen for coming too. Of course, of course. Thank you guys for um, having ha having me on and also being on me. Okay, that doesn't that doesn't sound right. Anyway, I congrats on the launch, and we're super excited to have uh, Perpetual Protocol on Optimus Ethereum. So it's great. Yay, rainbows! <laughs> yeah, thank you, Ben. Yep. Uh, yeah, thank you everyone for coming here for this same ad. Yep. Woo. Woo. Yeah, thank you guys. Uh, well, we actually have one question from MD. Did you want to ask? Uh, I'll just quickly preview, but. Uh oh, we got a straggler. I, I can I can do it if, if MD so dares. <laughs> oh, hi. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I came on late, but I do have one last question. Is just, I guess, how is composability being uh tackled or or what is the future of composability across uh l2s um and how that might affect Ooh. uh the future of adoption of l2s is that oh oh what a question oh i love this question oh my god i've, t I've in spirit i've touched on this a little bit but i'm so happy to have it posted so directly okay so the, so the question is how does how do layer twos and what is, and uh, relate to composability and how do we see that? Whoops, sorry, set off my ice maker. One sec. Okay, there we are. So how, do, how does composability work and how does it fit into the L2 landscape? So first of all, what is composability, right? This is like a super buzzword. You know, you've got your DeFi Legos that are composable. I think I'll highlight one aspect of compo And so composability can mean different things in different contexts, right? So like, Maybe you think of composability as like, um, you know, Photoshop and uh, well, I don't know, GIMP, which is, okay, that's open source Photoshop. Shout out to the GMU image manipulation program. You might call these two photo editing softwares composable because you can take a photo from one and export it and import it to the other one. Okay, maybe a better example is Microsoft Word and Google Docs are composable, right? Because they both use the same formats and you can move docs between them, right? So that's usually actually not what we mean when we say composability. But if you draw the analogy, right? There's already composability in that sense between these layer twos because they share a layer one and they share those assets. And so when you bridge funds between from one to the other, right? It's kind of like moving the document from Google Docs into Microsoft Word. Okay, so that's one way that we could think about composability. and it's, there will be improvements to these bridges that we've been talking about, but that's not the whole story of composability. There's another extremely important aspect to composability that is, some, that is probably better referred to as atomicity. Okay, what is atomicity? Atomicity uh, is, comes from atom, right, atomic, uh, and it comes from that word because the idea of an atom, at least, you know, before we invented the, <laughs> we invented the nuclear bomb, was that these things could not be split apart. It's a fundamental unit. And so this is, this is the basis for things like flash loans, right? What is the property of a flash loan? The property of a flash loan is that you make two things atomic. The one thing is sending the money to the person taking out the flash loan. And the other thing is the person that took out the flash loan returning the money at the end of the loan. They're atomic. The whole point of a flash loan, the reason that, uh, you know, anybody can, quote, take out a flash loan is because... The protocol enforces atomicity 
so that either the money is sent and returned or the money was never sent in the first, it never gets sent, right? So this is like a sort of a super important thing that when we talk about composability, oftentimes that, that's how you can interpret it. And it is true that the picture is fundamentally different for um, composability in that sense, in that sense of atomicity, either doing two things or neither. Another, the common an analogy here, by the way, is the um, train hotel problem, which basically, basically is a problem statement of, imagine that you want to book a train ticket and you want to get a room in a hotel, but either one might fill up and you don't want to get a train ticket unless you know you have a place to sleep and you don't want to get a hotel unless you know you can get there. So that's like, you want to execute those two purchases atomically. Um, that is a harder problem in layer two because each of these chains are sort of, at least as the uh, ecosystem stands now, are independent, uh, uh, sort of independent chains that can't interact with each other in this way. Effectively what it means is you, you can't um, do or avert across chains. So doing something like a flash loan that starts on one chain and ends on the other is, you know, depending on your definition, f f impossible. And so this is a problem because atomicity and that composability is part of the reason that Ethereum saw the massive success that it has seen over the past few years is because everything plugs into each other. We can make these crazy flash loan revert or don't agreements, right? And these are really important. It's the basic of how we think about smart contracts today. So when I was talking before about the 2022 for Ethereum, being uh, addressing some of these big blockers, this is kind of what I'm talking about. There are ways to create big chains with lots of these atomic transactions throughout them that scale beyond what an, any individual rollup uh, scales to today. So that's, that's, sort of, that's sort of the two parts of this that I would say. It's like, depending on what you mean by composability, it's either solved or eh, in reality, you really want these atomic flash loan type transactions, in which case it's not solved. And some of that we will just have to accept and deal with, um, but it is fundamentally a fragmentation of liquidity and it's fundamentally uh, not great. And we're gonna solve that problem in 2022. most thorough response I've gotten on the topic to date. So thank you for that. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, I may not be coherent, but I am thorough. <laughs> Much appreciated. And thanks for uh, sticking around. No problem. No problem. Thanks for a great question. Love that question. Yeah, thank you so much for the question, actually. That was a really, really great question and really, really nice one to sort of end it all on. So, um, yeah, thank you, everyone, for coming. And, yeah, definitely a special thank you to Ben again and thank you to Yanwen as well. Uh, yeah, thank you, guys. Woo! Thanks, everybody. See you on the interwebs. See you on the interwebs, guys. Thank you.